Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. This is 138 with Ishan Rakshit. He is the co-founder of Shopflow, a checkout infrastructure platform for direct-to-consumer brands. He was formerly an investor with Elevation Capital, which invests in early-stage startups out of India. And before that, he had started other companies. So today we're going to be talking about what it's like having been an entrepreneur, going to VC, and going back to being an entrepreneur, and from both points of view, why he thinks startups fail and how they can succeed. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about Shopflow, and we'll go from there. Thank you. As you mentioned, we are a checkout infrastructure platform, largely focusing on retail, online e-commerce brands to increase conversions and hence make more revenue out of the website channel. Um, we started working with brands in India and now are starting to work with brands in the United States and North America as well. Um, there are two things that we do when we integrate with them. We give them a better, smoother, faster checkout experience, which is the last stage of the purchase funnel. Essentially, after you've added products to your cart on an e-commerce website till the time you have bought it, we saw that around 70-75% people used to drop off. So you're trying to sort of make 15 to 20% on an average jump when we come in. And then obviously that translates to the brand's direct bottom line. And the second piece is because of certain tools and the platform features that we have, we are able to increase the ability to generate repeat sales, which in this market where customer acquisition costs are going skyrocketing high is becoming more and more important for these brands to handle. So we do that out of just a simple integration that they can do on their stores that they are built on, say, Shopify, WooCommerce, Magento, etc. They integrate with Shopify and these other things. So you guys aren't also connecting them with payment processing directly. They have to bring that to to the to Shoplo themselves. India and the US product differ in this matter because payments success rates is a big problem in India. Uh, so we allow direct integrations with payment processors uh, when it comes to India. Uh, in the US, we don't touch payments at all. We essentially ride on top of the Shopify checkout itself, just enhancing the experience using the certain levers that we have. Um, but yeah, in India, it's very important to do a direct connection because otherwise the infrastructure isn't that robust yet. So are you saying that Shopflow acts as a payment processing gateway for those Indian customers? No, we don't. So the great part is that you can work with uh, Razorpay, PayU, Cashfree, all of these are payment processors and gateways of India. You bring them to us and we have a portal where you can enter the you know, merchant ID and API secret. And right, I mean, with just a single click integration with any payment gateway, we just pass on the payments using our backend into the payment gateway. We never really handle payments ourselves. I've recently been interested in payment processing. And so I've been thinking about this more. Payments is a tough business to build otherwise. Yes. So that's why I wasn't sure. I know India has uh, definitely its own challenges. I've had some uh, clients that were Indian and some uh, co-workers that were Indian and um, I've and I've been to India and so sometimes I I think about those difficulties uh, that people in India have just trying to get things done I know the government has tried numerous times to get rid of crypto um, which could actually serve as a really interesting payment gateway system for uh, between you know domestic to international Right, so getting money in and out of India, but the government doesn't want it. Just like they burned all of the notes that were like under a hundred or under five hundred. I forget. I can't remember. Um, this was like last year or two years ago or three years ago. Caused a bank run. Yeah. <laughs> no, a lot of things have happened in India. To be honest, and you're absolutely right. The government is trying to do a lot of things to digitize payments, uh, but unfortunately, if the step is too radical. It just isn't really uh, super supported there. I think the reason why uh, Modi undertook this is because he wanted to get more tax money. Yeah. He, he wanted to make sure that a higher percentage of people from India actually paid their taxes. And this is a problem in China as well. I believe only 2% of Chinese actually pay taxes. Yeah. Um, because the government just has a really poor infrastructure for handling it. And I think India is similar, especially because there's so many people in rural areas that it's just so hard to get government officials out there. I mean... I, I remember hearing 
uh, for the national elections, they were sending government officials like walking through villages to just collect votes in India. Yeah, no, absolutely. That still happens, yes. So I can imagine it's very difficult to do business in India as a, a tech company because it's probably also quite radical for Indians. No, absolutely. And I think there are two parts to it, right? One is the change that you would want to bring might not have the right ecosystem support around you, and be it government, be it whatever comprises of the ecosystem. The other piece is that even if you do build something, the mentality will be always to bring the price down. Because given there are so many consumers in India, there's always going to be 10 people solving the same problem. And uh, unfortunately, specifically when it comes to software or SaaS, uh, the propensity to pay is really low, even for enterprises, even for mid-market customers, not just for the small ones. So I think the difficulty is aggravated with that uh, context in mind as well. Now, a lot of startups uh, use like auto debit from for their clients or like auto credit card um, like charges. Is that is it different in, in India? Because you said that it seems like some clients will use their service and just not pay. It wasn't possible until very recently. In fact, it probably got possible in 2022 itself. And that too for amounts less than 2000 rupees, that'll be what, around $25. As long as the transaction is less than that, you don't really need to sort of do a pin verification or an OTP verification as we call it here. Um, that part has gotten seamless and that's still only supported by a handful of banks. Uh, but there's a, there's still a long way to go. Is it difficult to run a startup from the U S that's focused on India? Uh, in fact, look at it this way, right? I mean, I feel like that approach never works. Uh, if your market is here, you'd rather be here and build it. What we feel is the market really is outside India. Um, and obviously India is a high growth market, but the base is really small. So for it to become as sizable as an opportunity as say North America, US, Canada, it's still going to be six, seven years at least. So if I have to also build for the present, that market is out in the US. Uh, for us, the difficulty is the other way around that for a team, which is largely based out of India, how do we build for a consumer? that is situated in the US in some sense. Um, and I think that's there are multiple problems to it. And <laughs> I wouldn't really go into depth there. But yeah, I think uh, this is a problem that has been solved by a lot of examples out in the market. We have obviously in India, we keep hearing stories of SaaS startups and this entire theme of building from India for the world is legit and it's happening. Uh, so I think the playbook has been written. Um, it's obviously a large dependency on how you execute it, but uh, I don't I don't think that's a that bigger challenge anymore. Now that there are so many great examples have done that. I've used some applications, some SaaS platforms that were built by Indian teams for the West, and I actually have some competitors that are in India um, focused on the West which I won't name, but I've used them and they've raised 40, 50 million dollars and they've been around for five, six, seven years. And I just feel like their product isn't good at all. It, it seems like it was built 20 years ago. One thing that I also gathered when I went to the US as well, uh, and I've been sort of uh, interacting with a lot of merchants and brands who are working there uh, the bar for quality that they have for a product or a software product specifically is really high whereas in india the mentality is that hey i mean i'm okay with a half-baked product as long as you bundle a great service around it because they want to extract value and the value might not come out of the product directly but actually by customizations that indian sort of customers would ask you to do uh, because of that, if you're really listening to the Indian customer and building in India and thinking that the product will work outside, the quality bar might not be met in some sense. Uh, so it's very important for us as well to really sort of focus on the customer, 
that is truly the market that we are going to build for and build for them. And obviously what we have seen time and again, that if, if you build a product that really matches that quality bar, it works everywhere as well. And again, the case would be in India as well. So Shopflow isn't your first company, but is it your first company where you're spending time outside of India while you're building it? Yes. Uh, previous company was focused on India where I was solving for a very small market as well. And that was five, six years ago. What made you want to do it differently this time? There were a lot of incidents and experiences because of which there was a bias to solve for businesses. As a management consultant, for example, the problems that I was solving by being part of the firm called Parthenon, it's a Boston-based consultancy firm, which has offices across the globe now much with Ernst & Young. Um, I was solving for business problems in education, in hospitality, healthcare. Um, so that bias was always there that, hey, let, let me just help businesses just becomes more relatable as such and a more homogenous solution to develop as well. Um, when I was working at MSCI, which was a Morgan Stanley spin-off into investment research, I was actually solving for businesses as well because my clients were BlackRock and the like, where I was actually working as a developer to really code, to create products for them. Um, even with my investment stint, where I did investments in fintech and SaaS companies, 90% of the investments that I would be part of or make or work with as portfolio were B2B companies in some sense. So there was obviously this entire conditioning that I had as I progressed through my career to solve problems faced by businesses. Uh, when I talk about businesses, it becomes very easy to start looking at where the market value is residing, where the, uh, if I build a product, great, it's productizable, great that it's scalable. But when you ask the question that a great investable business, for example, as an investor, it has to make money. And India is not a SaaS market for that. Uh, so just that filter obviously made us realize. And given that we were, we were when we started out, we started almost like listing a lot of problems down that, hey, merchants face these, these, these problems. It turned out that the problems were fairly homogenous across the globe. We were in fact speaking with merchants, not just in India, but in Southeast Asia, but in LATAM, as well as in US. And it was very clear that the problems are fairly similar. The solutions could be different, but the problems are similar. As long as I'm marrying myself to the problem, let me just focus on the market, which will pay me to solve it. And that's the filter that was very clear for us uh, from the start, which is why we didn't really think a lot. We just registered the company in the US as well. We raised foreign capital as well. Our investors are not Indian. Uh, the companies that the merchants that we speak to day in and day out are based in the US as well. If all of that was clear to you and it made sense, why did you still go after the Indian market as well? My co-founder who used to work in the same investment firm that I was in, he was in fact leading investments in e-commerce, direct to consumer brands in India. So for us, it was almost like a proximity bias that, hey, great, we're solving a global market, but can we quickly test out the waters here? Can we quickly learn a little bit here so that we also match the quality bar that's required to be global in some sense? So what we did, we started with the smallest merchant in India, went up the ranks, targeted mid-market, people who are doing a million dollar a year, and then went to enterprises and that's what we're working with right now so that that'll in fact and again the product that we work has been we made is has been made thinking that it should work across geographies um, so it was almost like hey this is a great pmf market we know all these people we know our customer these are great friends i don't have to worry about the effort i would have selling to them let's just quickly test it out there build an mvp get feedback and then build it out but always keeping the globalization of that product in mind. So we, we did that. I think it, it's only been like seven months since the product has been live. And I think the feedback has been super helpful to even chart out the product roadmap. But I agree with you, could have been done differently. It's just we wanted quick feedback, quick validation so that we 
sort of move very fast as well. So you feel like the feedback you got from those Indian customers were valuable with customers outside of India? What a US small customer wants is very similar to what a Indian mid-sized customers want. What a US mid-sized customers want is very similar to what an enterprise is solving for in India. Knowing that transitive relationship in mind, uh, it was fair to sort of kind of move up in the market in India so that we can solve for the sizable growing brands in the US as well. Which one is more profitable per unit right now? Which like the US or India? So we haven't started pricing the product in the US or selling it in some sense. We're still in very testing phases right now where some brands, we have just gone to them and said, hey, you know what? We're going to increase your revenue. We're not going to charge for it. Just start using. Let me hear similar feedback. Let me make sure that I expose the right feature to you at the right time as well. Uh, probably will, given that we don't, we're not really in a super rush to make revenue in the US immediately. Probably will do that till May and June before we start figuring out GTM scaling plans and pricing as well along with it. Uh, Indian pro product is actually very fairly profitable. We make around 80-85% gross margin on that. Um, obviously, uh, the only cost that we have is salaries. That isn't a lot in India as well. Uh, so we are, in fact, with the Indian product, should be profitable in a few months' time as well. I'm sure your investors are very happy about that. <laughs> I hope so too. I think the need of the R is uh, also business sustainability and profitability. So that's that's gotten reiterated a lot of times from the investors as well. Is the way... Startups are fundraising, how much they're fundraising and what they what valuations they can get for that. Do you think that's changing? And do you think that change is based on a newer demand for profitability sooner or just the global markets uh, shifting in general or COVID? Or... I think that has changed a lot. I think a lot of it, there were a lot of triggers initially uh, with the war in the background, obviously, Initial, I think 2021 and 2020 were great years, to be honest. Um, you could have no revenue, absolutely. And I was seeing companies getting funded at valuations of 100 million, 200 million, left, right, and center. And that was actually not just in the US. It was happening in India. It, it was happening everywhere. Uh, and we were all like, I mean, this company doesn't even need this capital. What are they going to do? Um, so I think a lot of that... Uh, was happening. I know a lot of founders that I used to work with very closely uh, had a very strong hint that, hey, you know what? I know the market is very rewarding right now, but I know the winter is coming. So let me at least raise this much amount so that I have a massive war chest because ultimately when you reach that size of businesses, capital becomes a moat. You can outperform competition if you have the right capital because you start making strategic choices and investments basis that capital. So a lot of people were actually doing that and they were actually pitching to their investors that, hey, the question that we were looking for in this industry, the answer is with us. You have to put a bet on us that, hey, these are the winners here in this race and just double down on those investments in that year itself without waiting for traction so that in the future, I have a stronger right to the throne in this segment versus what I have right now. Uh, I think it was around March 22 when all of it just started crumbling down and a lot of things were happening in some sense. Uh, obviously, the public market started showing some colors. There's the war that happened in the background. A lot of capital pool was sort of uh, showing bad returns as well when it came to large hedge funds them failing and obviously when that part of the pyramid crumbles a lot of these smaller funds ends up showing that ripple effect as well so i think 2022 was very mellow when it came to investments already uh, people announced funding rounds that they had raised right before the so-called winter had begun i think that is continuing right now i keep chatting with my friends in venture capital I don't think rounds are happening right now, specifically people who are raising series A and above. Opportunistic seed bets are being made, but everyone else has to prove good amount of value uh, to really demand a up valuation. There are down rounds happening. There are rounds happening. Uh, 
at the same valuation as well but uh, good financing rounds are not happening anymore is uh, what i've seen i'm feeling that this will continue for another 8 to 10 months as well i've heard that the best companies are built at times like these yeah but would you rather be an investor or a founder right now i feel given what i always wanted to do i would always be a founder uh for me when i became an investor and in fact i remember when i was chatting to the partner of the fund that i interviewed with before i had joined it was very clear for me that i am looking at a, as a it's it's my own gtm in some sense that hey i'm going to come i'm going to talk to a lot of these founders network learn have a stupidity filter on my ideas be slightly more pessimistic and so on and so forth i'm going to use all of that when i become a founder next uh so i went in with that intention as well um um no but yeah i think it's it's a great time to be a founder for sure definitely even despite all of the issues that we're facing with trying to fundraise and trying to get companies to become customers and give us money so that we can grow and all of that absolutely i feel like when you choose to become a founder you're looking at a it's you're not looking at a couple of years or a couple of months it's a decade long game at least and you will end up and every founder would have who has built a successful company would have definitely seen one or two cycles like this it's up to your judgment and your business maturity to make sure the company just sails through it and survives and you keep on adding value to your customers uh but yeah i i i think it's it's obviously a great time uh a lot of sectoral nuances have started happening for sure i know founders aren't super excited to build in the consumer space a lot uh people are realizing that if i can't monetize a 100 million user base might as well just wait it out because any b2c play requires you to spend marketing money and an investor isn't really giving consumer valuations anymore but in saas where you feel that hey funding from a vc is an optionality if i do it i will scale faster if i don't do it i will still have a path to profitability if i want to and i think that's making saas very exciting right now as well what made you want to become an investor after you left your last company just the want of being closer to the ecosystem i think the view that an investor has on a startup ecosystem is unparalleled um they know the nitty gritties of what's happening the trends that are shifting um the network that you build with great quality founders and the learnings that you are able to just get first hand when you have a conversation with them the ability to actually work with portfolio and know the deeper problems that the founder is trying to navigate the company through it's all of it is very unreachable if not in a vc profession uh so for me it made a lot of sense to actually just gain access to that level of insight to that level of network that i can actually start building my cell phone and my future on in some sense i feel like i get to learn about a lot of the deeper problems founders have because of the podcast without having to be a full time investor but i can imagine how when you're giving them money they're more likely to tell you even more problems um even though you don't want to hear their problems you want to hear their successes but you need to know their problems in order to help them to get to their successes sometimes if you're able to the job pays you well so to become a founder it just gives you a lot of mental um peace to have a financial cushion as well because you don't know when you're going to get funded if at all you're going to get funded so might as well just have a cushion of amount of money that you can still build a team if you want and if you have that conviction in your idea just financing yourself as well and that was very important uh from day one you'd rather be a founder but it pays more to be an investor absolutely so then why would you want to be a founder yeah no that's a fair point i feel like it's never a rational choice to be a founder uh especially in my case i don't know how better to put it but when the even though i did it while i was still in college or high school or, i mean college uh that was the first time i started my company i just couldn't zone out of that feeling in some sense i always wanted to get back to doing it and proving it again and uh, 
never really was a rational thought i wanted to just in fact every year after i graduated from college shut my company down that was 2017 i wanted to start up again 2018 i wanted to start an edtech company 2019 i wanted to create a remote health consultation platform 2020 i wanted to build a mental health platform with a consumer focus 2021 was when i started thinking about shopflow so i think it's almost like you've you've tasted blood once and it it you have to just get back to it and i i don't think it was a rational decision at all do you feel like spending that time as an investor made you a better founder i think a lot of what we do building organizations now at shopflow for example uh it comes from anecdotes uh it comes from anecdotes and again right that's probably something that you would also get when you talk to founders but as an investor i was able to also learn real examples of how someone solved a problem in org ex- expansion or in an international gtm and so on and so forth uh, also some very small nuances how do you structure a certain policy within the company all of those things you actually are seeing happening first hand and because i was actually working with early stage companies people who had just started or raised a seed round or series a the breadth of problems that i saw them solve first hand was a lot and you are seeing a lot of companies at once i was talking to in fact five to six startups every day the amount of knowledge that i was able to get is unparalleled and i feel like today most of i i talk a lot in anecdotes I feel like that's very helpful for me to even add context to whatever I'm trying to implement here at Shopflow. I think that's been the biggest value add as such. Obviously the network is great. As a founder you want to sort of derive a lot of value out of the ecosystem. The ecosystem usually is supportive and I I feel like I got introduced to the ecosystem because I was an investor. Um and that's been super helpful as well. I think the third piece is I don't know how much valid it is in the US but in India being a part of a well renowned VC I think the one that I worked in was one of the top 3 largest funds in India uh there is a certain aspiration attached to that job so when I hire people they have a certain connotation about a certain indexing that they have done that hey if the founders have this sort of a background should be fun working with them I don't know how that works but I do feel that this is also one of the interesting merits of coming from that background and having done that. What's the most important thing you've learned from being an investor? Oh. I think uh and a role as an investor makes you extremely pessimistic because your daily job is to say no to ideas. Uh and i feel like just finding hope or you know taking a punt in some sense it requires a lot of courage as an investor because great i mean the founder would love to get money from you but you have to justify it to people in the fund you have someone who is invested in your fund or someone or the partner or other partners to make a case and bring the case to the table i feel like that those were moments where i felt like i was perhaps more passionate about the idea than the founder itself and i feel like that that was probably the most interesting and more impactful learning that i had during the period what's the most important thing you've learned from being a founder so far when we're building an organization nothing matters more than trust uh i feel like there is every every role at shopflow for example is a high ownership role if i'm not trusting a person enough things won't get done as well and that applies to my co-founders that applies to the next person i'm going to hire and if i optimize for the ability of being trusted or whether i'm getting reliable people on the team if that's the absolute filter that i have i will i'm sure i will make a great organization and if great smart reliable people are aligned on the same cause and vision there is very little chance that the product or the company will fail 
Um, I feel that I mean, if I have to summarize, otherwise there are so many great learnings otherwise. So how do you know that you can trust someone? Uh, I'll be honest, I have never really thought about this question, but uh, so far it's been working on autopilot somehow in my subconscious. Um, I, I trust myself a lot. Uh, if I'm able to say that, hey, this guy will do this better than I can, or I will be able to trust this guy with this job more than I can myself. I think that's the old, only question it boils down to. Uh, somehow it comes across in conversations. Uh, sometimes it comes across in certain gestures. A lot of times it takes months to come across uh, from a person as well. Um, but I, I feel like that's the that's the metric or the benchmark that I end up equating it with. I think that's a very valuable response. I would have never thought about that before. When I'm looking to hire people, I normally think, is this someone that I feel understands the culture? Do we have a similar uh, desire in what we get out of what we do? Um, and is this someone that I'd want to be friends with? Even if we don't go and have a beer together, is this someone I would want to, right? That's kind of the foundation for, for fit for me. And then obviously we go through um, hard skills and all that to make, to, to make them prove that they're the best person to actually do the job. Um, but I had never thought about it as, is this someone I feel I could trust to do a better job than me? Cause most of the positions I hire for, I can't do those things anyways. So I, I'm almost 100% guaranteed to trust someone's going to be better than me at something. So for me, trust is a difficult thing to use in a hiring process. A lot of it, what do you say when it comes to shop flow, for example, ends up getting equated to a culture fit or not. Uh, ends up being in the same bracket as, as well, right? For example... It might be that this person does not come from the necessary or the required background. But because I'm seeing a lot of passion and the ability of, you know, you know, move fast, break things, attitude and stuff like that, that helps the trust quotient. It need not be very fixed markers as well. So a lot of what you're saying is what I'm also saying in some sense. But in my case, given that our team is very young, a lot of people are fairly little experienced in some sense. Uh, uh, it's more about the attitude and the ability, whether given a task, will they just give it all to make it happen or not? Uh, versus really thinking about whether they were coming from a sales background, have they done it before? Um, and very solid culture fit metrics that slightly larger odds would be able to define. We also don't worry about culture a lot, to be honest, at least at this scale. Uh, we've realized that we have not reached a scale where we have a stronger culture than a person who would bring it. Uh, so it ends up happening that we're still probably waiting for the 30, 40 people to join so that there is a culture that everyone assign, aligns with. But till then, it's it's everything else that matters more. I know that you spend time in California. Do you have any employees in the U.S. or you just live here by yourself and the initial product and gtm discovery always needs to be done by the founders else perhaps we are going to build in a wrong direction as well uh, we also don't still have the maturity of figuring out who to hire and how to hire there and what we look at when we hire in india might be different from what we look at when we hire in the us i think it'll take us some time to get there and once that's the right time, we also we definitely anticipate setting up a sales, marketing, and a product team in the US. While we do feel, given the cost arbitrage, most of the technology will still be built from India. I've interviewed uh, another person before who has all of the development in China. He's Chinese. So all of his de development is done in Shanghai, but all of his sales and marketing are done out of Silicon Valley with uh, like people who are living there and working there. Um, I see nothing wrong with that model, especially if you can raise enough to make it worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How can people follow up with you or your business? Or From a timeline perspective, uh, we do plan to launch the product in the US um, sometime in April, uh, properly with a, with entire pricing, etc. figured out. 
um, we still don't have a domain where we want to, if we can have people sort of reach out to right now they can reach out to us on shoflo.com but we are planning to sort of uh, create a certain different identity in the us as well uh, so we'll figure that part out um, but no i think uh, i've been very openly connecting with a lot of people in the us already so just happy to kind of speak with people from linkedin email when it's ishan at shoflo.com i-s-h-a-n at the rate s-h-o-p-f-l-o.com all of those links will be in the show notes so uh thank you very much ishan i appreciate your time and your energy this was a very interesting conversation about both sides being an entrepreneur and an investor and then going back to it and insights uh, gleaned from both of them you're making me think maybe i should spend some time as a vc to become a better founder uh probably not but it's interesting for sure And uh, don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day.